We are continuing in our series in 1 John. Now, the letter of 1 John uh, was written to a struggling church. It was a church that was struggling with two things primarily, assurance of salvation and struggling with authentic faith. Do I have to live out this faith that I say I have? Is it enough just to say I love God and I don't actually have to do anything about it? And so John writes this letter to encourage this church and to correct their thinking. In 1 John 5, 1 through 5, where we're going to be this morning, John addresses both of these main themes of how do I know if I belong to God, and if I belong to God, what do I do with that? How does it affect the way that I live? John addresses both of those. In these verses, he outlines who it is that belongs to God, who it is that belongs to the family of God, and then those that belong, well, what does it look like? How should they live? And what he says is that being a part of God's family matters. Being a part of God's family, it, it means something. Being a part of God's family has, 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 uh, uh, has, has an impact on our lives. That being a part of God's family has a family resemblance. Now, I, I grew up in a large family. I have three brothers and a sister. And I was reminded all throughout my life that we all looked the same. Everywhere we went, it was like, you guys all look the same. You guys are twins and all these things. And, and I was always told I looked like my dad and Everywhere we went, we were reminded of our family resemblance. And, uh, and it wasn't just physical. We, we were told that characteristics looked the same, that, that we were all uh, musicians or, or athletes or that we all loved serving God together at church. And, and there was all these ways that, that people who knew us, they could just kind of pick us out of a crowd and go, you guys belong together, I can tell. And now that I have kids of my own, I, I love seeing that in them as well. I love seeing the family resemblance uh, with, with, with my daughters as well. And sometimes it's in a little face that they'll make or a joke that they'll make. And, and they'll just be like, oh, you, you belong to this family. I can see it. And there's just a certain joy that comes with seeing the family resemblance. And I'm sure your family's the same way. I'm sure if I were to meet your siblings or, or parents or family members, I probably would notice a certain family resemblance, that being a part of your family means something. That being a part of your family, there's a, there's a shared uh, list of characteristics and being a part of God's family is no different. Being a part of God's family, there is a shared list of characteristics. There's similarities and family resemblance that we share by being the family of God. And in these verses, John lays out what that family, family resemblance is. He says it's faith, love, and obedience. That's what the family of God looks like, faith, love, and obedience. So what I want you to hear this morning is that children of God are marked by faith, love, and in obedience. That's the family resemblance that we all share. So let's read together. Uh, we're in 1 John chapter 5, starting in verse 1, and we'll read through 5. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that has overcome the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Would you pray with me? Father God, I thank you for your word. I ask that you will speak to us from your word. I ask that what we're, what we're not, you'll, you'll make us through your word. Open our, our hearts and our, our minds to hear from you this morning. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the main idea I want you to hear is that children of God are marked by faith, love, and obedience. So the first marker of faith, uh, the first marker of being in the family of God is faith. Children of God believe the right things. John is writing this letter to combat false teachings. And so he starts by saying right here, Believing about Jesus is the most important thing. Believing the right things about Jesus. So take a look at verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. So who, who makes up this family? It's everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ. Everyone who believes the right thing about Jesus. This is the most basic marker of, of a believer, of the family of God. That's what the word Christian means. We say the word Christian so often. Christian means a follower of Christ, a little Christ. Someone who is following Jesus as Christ. And as we're going to see in the rest of the passage, this belief, this faith is not simple mental assent. It's not just saying the right thing. It's a faith that gets lived out in love and action. 
And I love how succinctly John explains the family of God. He says, everyone's the family of God who believes that Jesus is the Christ. He's sort of using a shorthand for the gospel here. Jesus is the Christ sort of stands in for everything that the New Testament says about the gospel of Jesus. And this is the gospel. Sin separates us from God. We are in need of a Savior because we're sinners. So God sent his only unique son to be our Savior. Jesus lived a perfect life. He died a sacrificial death. And if we place our faith in him as our Lord and Savior, we receive life and salvation and victory. Then we're saved into God's family, and everyone who's in God's family gets to live with him for all of eternity. That's the gospel. And then John just shorthands it by saying, Jesus is Christ. If you believe that Jesus is Christ, if you believe what is most important about Jesus, then you're in the family of God. You get to be born into this family. And I'll tell you, this is a great family to be born into. There's some perks to being in this family. There's some perks to having God as our father. There's, there's, there's some perks to having Jesus as our oldest brother, so to speak. And if you look at verses 4 and 5, you, you see those perks. It says, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? John directly connects our faith with the victory that we have in Jesus. He says this is the victory, our faith. It's not some generic faith. It's not some generic belief. It's a faith in a person, in the one who has overcome the world. It's Jesus, the Christ, that we read about in verse 1. His victory over sin and death becomes our victory by faith. We get to take on his victory by, by virtue of being a part of his family. If you're like me, then for the past few weeks, you've been glued to your TV watching the Olympics. And for, for, for my family, we have it on. We had it on all the time. I'd get home from work, and it would already be on. And we'd sit down as a family and watch it, which usually turned into my daughters acting out whatever sport they saw on the TV because it's like, I could do that. And so, you know, they'd do their floor routine or whatever. And, and, but we would watch because it's, it's fascinating because this is the highest athletic achievement we can think of. Like everyone in the whole world picks their very best and sends to compete with each other. These athletes who have, who have sweat and bled for this sport and they become the very best and then they get to achieve at the highest level possible. There was this great moment that was caught on film um, there was uh, Simone Biles, who, who I think she had just won her like 87th Olympic medal or whatever. And, and she, she comes off, she gets, she gets her, her medal and everything, and the camera crew followed her out of the arena where she met up with her whole family and she hugged her mom and immediately took her medal off and she put it around her mom's neck. And her mom, you know, held the medal and looked at it and held it for a couple minutes and she kept hugging more family members and the mom took it off and put it on someone else's neck and they kind of enjoyed it for a second and they just passed it around to this family and I just, I was watching this thinking, Simone Biles was the one that went out and did all the work. She was the one that did the routine that would have put all of us in the hospital. But then they all got to wear the medal just by being part of her family. They got to say, I get to enjoy this victory. I get to know what it feels like to wear an Olympic gold medal. Why? Because I'm, I'm in her family. I'm with her. They, they got to experience what it felt like to wear the medal. Victory in Jesus is something like that. He did all the work. He, he was the one that, that sweat. He was the one that literally bled to earn the victory on our behalf. And then we get to put on his medal. We get to enjoy it. We get to enjoy in his victory because we're in his family. What a great family that we get to be a part of. Jesus overcame the world and sin and death. That's what Jesus did on the cross. That's what his work, his blood, his sweat did for us. He put the work in and paid the price, and we get to share in the victory. Why? Because we're born in, in the same family. Because we share this family resemblance, we get to share in his victory as well. What a great family we get to be a part of. So children of God are marked by faith. They believe the right things. And then children of God are marked by love. They exist in this loving family. So take a look again at verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father has been born of him. The family of God is marked by love. We exist in this loving community. We, we exist in this community that's built on love. It's love from God. Love for God and then love for one another. That's, that's the family that we're born into. A, a love from God, love for God, love for one another. 
And Jesus says the ones who believe the right things are born into this family. And he describes what this family looks like. It's a family where the father loves his children deeply. The children love and respect the father. The children love each other and serve each other in Christian community. This loving family is primarily built around the love from God, the love of God. A few verses prior to where we're reading in chapter 4, verse 19, John wrote, we love because he first loved us. This loving father loved us first when we were not deserving of his love. He loved us deeply. In John 3, 16, we read, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. This is the, the kind of love we have from our father. A father that loved first and a father that loved extravagantly, poured out, sacrificed for his children. And this becomes the foundation of all Christian love. This becomes the foundation of all Christian love. We're able to hand out love because we've received so much from God, our father. So, so the, the love from the father doesn't just land on us and stay there. We don't just collect it like a, a reservoir. We get to then pour it back into this loving family. So first, we pour it out by loving the Father. Verse 1 says, if you've been born of God, then you love the Father. He loved us first, and we get to love him back. What does this look like? Well, we see in, in, in the next couple verses that this love comes with action and obedience. And we're going to talk about obedience in just a second, but, but what would be some other indicators, some other markers that we could look for of proper love to God our Father? Well, I have three diagnostic questions that we can honestly ask ourselves and say, am I loving the, the, my heavenly Father the way that I should? The first question is, do you desire time with him? Do you want to spend time with him? This would be reflected in probably time in his word and time in prayer. Are we desiring to be with him and to be close to him through prayer through his word. If, if, if anyone, my wife or a friend or someone said, I love you, but I don't ever want to see you or talk to you or spend time with you, we'd probably say, you probably don't, right? You would probably start asking some questions. A love for God is similar. When we, when we love him, we desire time with him. We want to, to spend time with him in, in, in prayer and reflection. So do you desire time with him? The second question is, do other people love God more by being around you? You know what I mean, right? Like there are some people that you spend time with and just by being around them, it makes you love God more. You spend time with them and it just increases your love in your heart for God. Can we be that for someone else? Is, is our love for God so overflowing that other people are getting this kind of like secondhand affection by being around us? That they're like, man, I love God more because I'm around you. Do, do other people love God more by being around us? And the, the third question is, is your love for God expressed in immense gratitude? Like, like the woman in Luke 6 who anoints Jesus' feet. And Jesus says about her, those that have been forgiven very little love very little. And those who have been forgiven very much, they love greatly. They love with this immense gratitude. Y'all, we have been forgiven very much. And we should be pouring out immense gratitude to our God. Immense gratitude in our conversations. Immense gratitude in our lives. So do we love our Father this way? I pray that we, I pray that we do. So we have a father that loves his children. Then we have children that love their father. But then John keeps pressing in and he says, and if you love your father, well, then you will love everyone who's been born of your father. There's a certain logic here that we just kind of know is true. If someone says that they love me, but then they treat my children very badly, they, 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 we probably aren't going to be friends for very long. Like that, that's not what love looks like. If, if you love the father, you're going to love the children as well. And that's what John says here. Anyone who loves God will necessarily love other brothers and sisters. This is what it looks like to be part of the family of God. And this isn't new and this isn't controversial. Like John is just saying what, what has been said all throughout the Bible and all throughout the New Testament. Jesus said the same things to his disciples. In John 13, 35, Jesus says, By this, all people will know that you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. When we belong to the family of God, we love God's children. We love one another. Often throughout the New Testament, we're, we're told to love outsiders and strangers and, and, and our neighbors, and, and that's true. We should. But here in 1 John 5, 1, and also when Jesus was talking in, 13, 30, in John 13, 35, we're specifically being told to love brothers and sisters, those that are in the family of God, that others outside will know us 
whether, by, by whether we're marked by love for each other. They'll know whether we belong to God by how we love each other. So a moment of, of honest reflection, how are we doing in that? If someone were to watch our life, would they know that we belong to each other? Would they see the family resemblance? Would they see the love that we have for each other? Would they see a community of believers that are serving each other, trusting each other, holding each other accountable, saying hard things to each other in love, asking for forgiveness, granting forgiveness, rooting out bitterness and resentment, refusing to gossip and slander? Is that the kind of community people would see if they were to watch us? This is what it looks like to love one another. And this goes deeper than just preference or or friendship. Sometimes friendship can be easier than family. Your friends are people that you handpicked because you already know you get along. Family's not that way. We we don't get to choose our our family. Our family is, is by blood. And the family of God is the same way. We are by blood. We have been bought and purchased and made a family by the blood of Christ. And what that means is that sometimes... That makes it hard to be in relationship with each other because we we didn't necessarily choose each other. Maybe you chose to come here to Exodus, but you didn't choose who else came. You didn't choose the siblings that you get matched up with, and sometimes it feels like I got matched up with some dysfunctional siblings, and this is hard to do, and that's true. If, If you came to Exodus and you were thinking, maybe I've finally found that perfect church family, and I've finally found the perfect family, that's not us. We're not the perfect family but we are a family by the blood of Christ. And what family does is they serve each other. What family does is they love each other. What family does is they go, they go beyond preference and they love deeply because we've been bought by the blood of the Son. If we love God the Father, we will love his children as well. The family of God is marked by faith. We believe the right things. And we're marked by love. We exist in a loving community, a loving family. And then third, children of God are marked by obedience. Children of God are joyfully obedient. So take a look at verses two and three with me. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God when we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. John explains that three things go together. Love for God, love for others, and obedience to God's commands. And he says these three go together, and it seems like one is evidence of the other, and which would mean a lack of one seems to be pointing to maybe a lack of the others. Love for God, love for others, and obedience to God's commands. These three things just necessarily go together. Children of God who believe the right things, who are born into this family, they follow God's commands. And they do it with joy. And you might be here and you might say, well, man, there are so many commands in the Bible. Every time I open the Bible, I see another command and another command. How could I learn all these commands? And then not only that, actually follow them, actually do them. There are so many commands in God's word. And Jesus was asked a similar question. He was asked, what is the greatest? What's the most important command? And how did he answer? He he said, well, there's, there's kind of two headings. Love God with everything you have and everything you are and love others. Love God and love others. He said, all commands hang off these two commands. All of the commands can be summed up in just these two of love God and love others. Now, there's a bunch of commands that we should follow in the Bible, but the way we follow those with joy is by seating them underneath those two commands, underneath those two headings of love God and love others, because when obedience comes out of a heart of love, that's when, that's when it's a joyful obedience. That's when we're able to follow God's commands, and they're they're not a burden, like verse 3 says. God's commands are not a burden to us because we're we're doing it out of a heart of love. Obedience flows out of a heart of love. All throughout 1 John, love and obedience has been tied together. If you've been here for this sermon series, you've heard love and obedience tied together time after time. I I just want to turn to a couple places in, in the book of 1 John. So turn over. It's probably like one page over. 1 John 2, verse 3. 1 John 2, verse 3. And this is what John writes. He says, And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Love and obedience tied together, intrinsically tied together, inseparable. 
Now turn to 1 John 3, 23. Same page, maybe one page over. It teaches this same idea, love and obedience, starting in verse 23. And this is the commandment that we believe in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. Love and obedience intrinsically tied together. If you love God, you're going to obey him. You're going to do the things that he's called to do. And if you're like me, you might be sitting here thinking, I do love God, but I don't always obey him. You might think sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to think of God's commands like a burden. And it's great that John is saying the commands of God aren't a burden, but sometimes I feel like they are. Sometimes I'm tempted to see God that way. I'm tempted to see his commands as some standard that I'm reaching for. So many of us can be tempted to think of that, and we, we end up seeing God's commands as this burden that crushes us with guilt anytime we don't measure up. So how do we fight against that? How do we fight against the temptation of seeing God's commands as a burden? When, when John is telling us the commands of God are not burdensome, they're not a burden to us. Our faith is not work harder. Our faith is not just do better. That, that's not grace. That's not the gospel. Well, the same John that wrote this letter is the same John that recorded the gospel of, of John. And so when he's writing things like this, I imagine he is recounting teachings that he heard from Jesus, like what he records in John 14. John 14, 15, when, when Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And then Jesus continues, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, and he will be with you forever. This helper that Jesus is talking about is the Holy Spirit. Jesus says he would send the Holy Spirit, and that this Holy Spirit would empower obedience in the hearts of people. And so here in 1 John 5, 3, it kind of feels like we, we get like this like secret cameo of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit shows up and says, listen, the, the, the law of God is not a burden. Why? Because as believers, we have the Holy Spirit who, who can empower right action, who can empower our obedience. Keeping God's commandments are not a burden because we have the power. We've been empowered by the Spirit to keep these commandments, so they're not a burden to us. They're not outside of our, of our uh, ability. How often have you heard someone who's outside of Christ, someone who's, who's, who's not a believer, talk about the commandments of God as, as this just set of rules. Look, I don't want to be a Christian. The Bible's just full of rules, and it's all these do's and don'ts. And, and, and they talk about the commandments of God like it's just this burden that gets, gets stacked on top of them. And so they end up rejecting following God because they don't want to submit their life to that kind of lifestyle. They don't want to submit their life to a, a God that would require them to change the, the things that they do or the ways that they act. To them, God's word seems like a weight. It seems like a burden. And I think if we were to really think about it, we'd say to them it is. It is a burden to try to follow the law of God perfectly. It is a burden to follow all the commands of God perfectly. It would take 100% of our effort, 100% of the time, and at the end of the day, we still would not have done it right. What a burden. And this is exactly why Jesus, our Christ, came to earth. Jesus came to earth because he was able to carry the burden that we can't. He was able to carry the burden of perfection because we couldn't. Jesus carried our burden, and then he offered us an, an easy yoke. And he says, hey, come take my yoke. It's easy and it's light. And so he carries the weight, and we get to share in the victory. And then Jesus didn't stop there. He, he carried the burden of perfection. He, he paid for the weight of the consequence of sin, and then he sent the Holy Spirit to then help us carry the weight of obedience. So Jesus carried the weight of sin and perfection, and then he sends us the Spirit to help us carry the weight of obedience. And those apart from Christ who don't have the Spirit, who have not been redeemed by the blood of Jesus, it just feels like a weight to them. But those of us that have the Spirit, those of us in Christ, we're able to say the commandments of God are not a burden. The commandments are, of God are not a burden. And so when we battle our flesh, when, when we start to see the the, the, the commands of God as a chore or a burden or as some standard that we are never going to live up to, we don't just grit our teeth and work harder. 
That's not grace. That's not the gospel. We pray to the Spirit and we say, empower right action. Soften my heart. Convict me of sin. Kill the sin in my heart. We, we get to go to the source of power to these things, which is the Holy Spirit of God. That's what joyful obedience looks like. It's, it's not fake it till you make it obedience. It's not reluctant obedience. It's not obedience under force of threat. It's joyful obedience that flows from the love of God, from the work of Christ, from the empowerment of the Spirit. Joyful obedience, it flows from the love of God, the work of Christ, and the empowerment of the Spirit. That's what it looks like to live joyfully obedient to God's commands. And so what does it look like to be in this family? What does it look like to to carry the family resemblance of God? Well, children of God believe the right things. Children of God exist in a loving family. Children of God are joyfully obedient. This is the family resemblance that we carry as believers, as the family of God. And so I, I want to close with asking you a question. Do you belong to God's family? Do you belong to God's family? And if you would say yes, if you would say, I, I belong to God's family, well then, are, are we carrying that family resemblance? Are we carrying that into the world? Do we look like faith, love, and obedience? Is that the, the family resemblance that we carry? Faith, are we believing the right things? Are we in God's word? Are we growing? Are we sharpening one another in what we know about God? Are we believing the right things about Jesus? Or are we resorting back to a a, a false version of the gospel where I have to earn it myself? Or are we believing the right things about Jesus? Love. Are we existing in this family of love? Are, Are we serving one another are we demonstrating the love that we've received from God? Are we, are we pouring that back out into the world? Are we receiving love from, from brother, brothers and sisters by serving and being served? Are we experiencing the love of brothers and sisters in a, in a community group that knows us and knows how to ask us the questions that we need to be asked, knows how to, how to sharpen our, our walk with, with Christ? And then are we living joyfully obedient to God's commands? If I were to, to guess, I think most of us struggle with joyful obedience. And some of us, it might be the joyful part, and some of us, it might be the obedient part. And if you're here and you're struggling with the obedient part of being a, being a part of God's family, I would ask you to hand that over to God. If there are parts of your hearts that, that, that you're refusing to hand over to God, you know the right thing to do, but you're, you're choosing not to do it. I want to ask that, that, that you will hand that over to God. Open every crevice and, and corner of your heart to the Holy Spirit. Be fully indwelt by what the Spirit wants to do in your life. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. If you're struggling with the part of, of simple obedience, take that step. Trust God in those things. His, his, his commands are not a burden to us. They're a gift to us. He's a loving Father that knows what's best for us. So trust Him in those ways. Now, maybe you're here and you struggle with the joyful part of joyful obedience. You can go through the motions. You can do all the things. You can check all the boxes, but it's not coming out of a heart of love. It, it's, it's coming out of a, a sense of guilt. It's coming out of a sense of duty. Maybe even it's coming out of a sense of self-righteousness. Repent of that, too. There's grace for you, too. Hand that over to God. Ask the Spirit to work on your heart in those things. Reflect on the love that you've received from your Father. Reflect on the work that Christ has done on your behalf. If you are in the family of God, then then let us rejoice and let us carry that family resemblance into the world. And now maybe you're here and you would answer no to that question. That you're not a part of the family of God. That you've never trusted God in this way. What I want you to hear is that you can be. This is open to you. Verse 1 of this chapter starts with the beautiful word, everyone. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ can be born of God. This is open to you today. And if you're here and you felt like the Lord is speaking to you, and, and he's calling you to himself, I would love for you to talk to someone about that. I'll be in the back, others will be as well. Someone sitting around you would love to talk to you. We, we would love to talk to you about what it looks like to follow Jesus, to be made a part of this family. 
And then you get to carry that family resemblance. We get to go into the world. We get to honor, honor our Father with our lives. We get to, to, to love one another in community. We get to live joyfully obedient, not carrying the burden and the weight, but handing those things to God, handing those things to Christ, resting in the, the salvation in the work of Jesus on our behalf. We get to joyfully obey God through our lives. We get to serve each other with love. We get to celebrate eternal victory. We get to put his medal on. And then we get to rest in the love of our Father today and forever. What a gift it is to be in God's family. Would you pray with me? Father God, I thank you for today. I thank you for the opportunity that we have to to open your word, to hear from it. I pray that you will speak to us from your word uh, today and, and, and every day. God, thank you for, for making us alive in this family. Thank you for giving us one another. Thank you for sending your son whose blood made this family possible. We love you, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.